and the company uh, so before i you know jump into the uh, documents of the company that i will be presenting as i think everybody knows it very well it's it's ambika cotton right and so i'll i'll so because it's a very well known company and all of you would have researched it in details in the past i would very quickly skip through or 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 or, or rush through the initial parts of the company where there's a bit of a business analysis and then uh, go into the thesis and then try to understand why the company is trading at the valuation it, it's trading at and then what could be the potential upside there Just let me know once the screen is visible and then I'll, I'll start. Uh, it's visible. Right. Okay. So, I mean, if we look at the uh, textile uh, value chain, so these are the five uh, key processes in the entire value chain, right? And then if we uh, look at it in general from, from an industry perspective, there's uh, the entire space is, is a very low margin and, and a cyclical space. Uh, uh, the the highest amount of margin that we see in this entire space is probably in the in the design space, right? And Ambika Cotton is, is involved very heavily in the spinning space, and and over the past five years they have added capacities in in the uh, weaving space as well. So uh, to start off, if we uh, look at the PNL of the uh, company, the the key things to note here in the PNL over over a, a ten year period is uh, the fact that the sales growth has remained fairly muted over a five-year and, and a nine-year period. Mm, the three-year number is a bit distorted because it, it's on a very low base of COVID, right? Uh, and the operating profit has uh, grown in, in line with the uh, sales growth and, and the profit before taxes has, has grow, uh, grown at 14% and 11% CAGR. Now, uh, the muted sales growth could be uh, because of three factors, right? One is uh, low demand of their product or inability, inability of the company's management side to onboard new customers or increase volume with existing customers. Uh, limited availability of raw materials and, and lack of management appetite to, to grow the business. Now, uh, the most likely reason in this case would be inability, inability of the management to onboard new customers or sell a higher volume to new customers. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, evident if we look at the capacity which the company has been adding and then the utilization of those capacities, because uh, the yarn capacity has been pretty much stagnant since March 2016. Is, are the numbers visible? Or let me just zoom in a bit, right? Yeah. This is good. Yeah. The numbers are visible now, right? Yeah. So so the, uh, and then please feel free to stop me whenever you, you think it's fine. So, so installed uh, spindle capacity has been pretty much flattish from 2016. I think 2016 was the last time they added any, any spindle capacity. And then the yarn capacity, the yarn business really started off around 14, 15 with very low capacity. And then uh, the capacity there also has been pretty stagnant since 2019. And if we uh, look at the production levels and, and the sales levels, both across cotton yarn and, and cotton fabric, we see that in cotton yarn, the company has consistently been producing much higher volumes than it could it, could, uh, it has sold in every, every year. And over the last seven year period, uh, the total production in lakh kgs was almost 1,500, whereas the sales has been significantly lower, around 1,000 lakh kilos. Uh, in, in fabric, the story is slightly different. They have been able to sell what they have produced, but also in fabric, what I feel is the machines have not operated at 100% capacity. For example, the production in 19 was 90 lakh kilos, which was significantly higher than what they have produced in 21, 22, or 23, right? So what, what my key takeaway from this was the company is very focused on maintaining their operating uh, efficiencies in the spinning business, but in the yarn business, the operating efficiencies probably does not impact the panel as, as such. And also the company is uh, very comfortable with holding uh, or interchangeably uh, keeping inventory and, and cash. And we will come to uh, the risks or the, or the advantages of that later, right? Now, uh, the, the key takeaway is no spindle capacity added since 2016 and fabric capacity since 2019. And production levels of yarn has remained on the high side all, uh, and, and rarely dropped below 180 lakh kilos over the past seven years. And fabric production has slowed down in 2023, but generally has remained in the range of 70 to 90 lakh uh, kilos between 19 and 22. Right. And now, uh, if we uh, look at uh, the numbers, 25% of the production of yarn is in inventory. 
And as I mentioned, uh, the company operates their machines at high capacity utilization levels, even during periods of low demand, and stores their uh, their uh, production in the form of inventory. And then we'll we'll come back to this and how this impacts the balance sheet and the valuations, right? If we uh, look at the uh, sales data uh, as imports versus exports, uh, over the past uh, four or five years, we see that a significant part of the production has been exports. Uh, so over 60% um, or sometimes stretching 70% has been the share of exports of overall sales. Uh, any any questions or, or comments here before I move to the gross margins? Have you studied their exports before? The yeah, so, where they go, uh, who their end clients are, uh, realizations, different grades of product. Have you studied this before? Yeah, so um, they have they export uh, to US, Europe. So uh, I, that that plate is there in the balance sheet. Uh, I'm not I'm not into the details of what's the realization per customer, but uh, broadly, if you uh, look at the overall realization or the uh, gross margins, it has remained fairly around the 18 to 20 percent range where now uh, when the cotton prices were flattish over 2016 to 2019 range uh realizations had gone up to uh or, or rather gross margins had gone up to around 29 percent last year when the cotton prices uh peaked or in 2022 when the cotton prices peaked and then again uh it dropped to around uh the 18 20 percent range the last quarter was exceptionally bad which uh, i think was a one-off where where the margins were at 11 percent i'm not sure why margins dropped to 11 percent but uh, what we generally see with Ambika Cotton is that um, even when the industry suffers from negative margins or very low single-digit margins, Ambika Cotton has somehow been able to maintain their uh, premium pricing power compared to the industry. Right? D does that uh, answer the question? Uh, uh, to, to come to the point of the realization per geography or realization per customer, I have not been able to find that data, but but will be interesting to look at that as well. Okay, we'll help you with that later. It's interesting. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, so now if I look at uh, the gross margins, so uh, I've just uh, taken the sales uh, of products from the total sales data, and then what's the cost of the materials consumed and the change in uh, inventory. So if I just look at the cost of materials, we see that the cost of materials uh, it's been pretty impressive for, for a cotton spinner spinning company, right? So the cost of materials as a percentage of sales has remained in the 60 to 65% range over the past decade. And I think that's uh, a very impressive number given the industry they're in. And what this also means is that uh, despite fluctuating prices of raw cotton and, and which also impacts the spread between the prices of cotton and cotton yarn, the company has, has retained a, a fairly stable margin profile, right? So which means the company is able to pass on a part of the increase in cost to their customer, probably not in, in its entirety, but a part of it is surely passed on to the customer. So this is how the cotton prices have uh, fluctuated. We'll also look at the uh, spread between cotton and cotton yarn. Uh, but but the key takeaway here is that uh, the margins have remained fairly flexible. The uh, the other thing is that uh, the company has also invested in in-house solar production uh, capabilities, which might reduce the cost of power and fuel, but that's not a very significant cost. So I, I don't see this impacting uh, the business very heavily. If I do a margin comparison with some of the other listed peers uh, in, in the cotton spinning space, uh, we see that they have some of the industry uh, leading, leading margins in that space, right? And this could be because of uh, either one or, or a combination of two factors, right? So they have a uh, premium quality of material, which is Supima and Giza cotton, which is the extra long staples cotton. And the end use is primarily clothes. So, so it's, it's used in shirt, shirts and t-shirts, right? And it's not used for um, bed sheets or, or curtains and those kind of uh, usage. So, so these two uh, factors give uh, them the ability to command uh, slightly higher margins than the industry. The other thing to uh, note here is that how they treat their uh, producers and customers and, and primarily producers. Uh, and, and why this is important is uh, because of two reasons, right? So there's a very high demand amongst spinners and garment manufacturers for Supima and Giza cotton because uh, of the higher margins associated with it as compared to regular cotton. And the second factor is that the supply of Giza cotton and Supima cotton is either constant. So for Supima cotton, it's constant. And for Giza cotton, it's on a constant decline over the couple of past couple of decades, uh, which means it's very critical to maintain good relationships with your suppliers as well. 
So yeah, you know, this this graph just shows us that that the area uh, under harvesting for for Giza cotton has been on a decline over the past decade, and we see that this is a trend which started in the early two thousands, right? And uh, for Supima cotton, Supima cotton is grown only in certain states in in the U.S., which uh, which makes it a, a very critical raw material which is um, low in supply. Now the company uh, ensures that they maintain long term relationships with their suppliers and and they do not negotiate prices or payment terms even during uh, stress financial periods like like COVID. Uh, and what this essentially helps them is uh, ensure that they are able to um, buy the amount of cotton. Uh, from their uh, suppliers year on year, which which uh, they need, right? Uh, and and the farmers would probably not sell to another company even if they offered them a uh, hundred basis point or one fifty basis point higher uh, price. Uh, this is important because in two thousand sixteen we had uh, seen that uh, certain companies had gotten in in trouble uh, over some 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 reputation issues because they were uh, blending Giza cotton with uh, Indian made cotton to the extent of a uh, ninety percent. Uh, Mix right, so ninety percent of the cotton, the the bed sheet was uh, Indian cotton, only ten percent was Giza cotton, and that uh, was being sold at Target and Walmart as as uh, Giza cotton, and and Wellspun had taken a, a big hit um, at that point in time, right? So so there's a bit of reputational risk associated with that. Uh, any any questions here before we move to balance sheets? Do they compete with people who might have access to Supima cotton? uh from a closer source like either in mexico or you know egyptian spin-offs like why did they choose to work with these two rare bits of cotton that are only got from you know halfway across the world that's a good question i haven't so the company uh i mean in, in the history of the company since 2006 or 7 is when i have uh seen some some of the documents i I don't think the company was ever uh, operating with Indian cotton. Uh, the advantage they have from working with these long staple cotton is, is of course, the higher margins that they enjoy over the industry and the pricing power. But uh, also the fact that uh, the cotton is sourced from halfway around the world also has a certain element of risk associated with it, right? So, so to specifically answer your question, uh, no, I don't have an answer to that question. Why they uh, operate in the premium segment have had, have not diversified to uh, the general cotton segment. Uh, especially when it is uh, struggling with growth, but but on the flip side, uh, if if the company were to deploy cash uh, or, or or were to uh, you know process cotton, which is the generic Indian cotton, it might put uh, pressure on the margins and impact the returns on capital as well, right? So uh, in general, if we compare the ROC of Ambiya Cotton with a Nitin Spinners or or a Bordhavan Textiles or some of the other companies, we would see that their ROC fluctuates between six percent to 20 25 percent across bad years and good years. ROC for, for Ambika Cotton has constantly been in the range of 18 to 23%. So mm, I think the primary reason why uh, Ambika Cotton operates uh, in, in this product space is to maintain their uh, gross profit margins and ROC levels. And I also have a question on this. Do they have any long-term supply arrangements with their suppliers? Uh, what the company says is that they have been working with the similar set of suppliers and, and wholesalers, so, so intermediaries. Uh, they uh, import from three countries, right? Uh, Egypt, USA, and Australia. Uh, Giza cotton, uh, they buy directly from the farmers and uh, the wholesalers in Egypt. So Pima cotton, they buy directly from the farmers in, in US. Australia is most likely certain intermediaries and wholesalers where, uh, in, in Australia where, where, whom they buy from. So... Um, the in terms of the contracts they have, uh, they uh, they of course face a bit of uh, the price fluctuation or or when the price goes up, they of course need to pay a higher price for for that. Uh, but uh, in terms of the contracts they have with their customers, they have been uh, on a consistent basis been able to pass on any price increases to their customers. So I think the flexibility of passing on the prices remains on the customer side rather than the than the supplier side. Uh, and do they talk about any volume? take commitments with their suppliers which leads to this healthy relationship like my broader thought process is basically they're importing uh, uh these cotton yeah uh these specialized cotton from different geographies uh mm -hmm. and as a result they're making yarn which gives them premium realization because it's made of premium cotton why is mm -hmm. nobody else doing that like is there volume of take commitments with the suppliers like uh, what's the uh, like why are they able to do this when others are not doing the same 
I, I, I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that question, but but it, it, I think it's a very interesting line of thought and, and needs to be explored. Okay, thanks. As a follow-up to Harsh, I think like when I was doing some scuttlebutt in this value chain, I've been hearing that a lot of capacity is being put up in Egypt and other parts of Africa in you know the manufacturing side of the value chain. And the same was true in uh, Mexico and Latin America, because this happened last year when the container prices were really high. So in the UK and EU, they were looking at near shoring. Uh, hmm. Same in, in the US. So have you worked out if there's any supply coming in that could mean that there's competition just in people who buy out from these suppliers? Mm -hmm. So so what you're saying is essentially the customers in, in US and Europe would have uh, a larger number of options in terms of buying from their suppliers. Right? Yeah, I'm just asking if there's more... Mm -hmm competition or supply of this yarn making coming in around Egypt and around Mexico? No, that, I have not explored that. Uh, I have one more question, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. So Pima is nothing but this Pima carton and they give license to the 600, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So do any other company or mail in India has the license compared to Ambika? Uh, I think I think Westfun and Indocount might have uh, have the license. I'm not sure if they do, but uh, they they are in a different uh, segment in that space. Okay, okay, because that also could kind of because I think it's about some. I'm sure it's a handful of companies. So if we can look, then we will already know how hmm. that competition could come from in case you know like. Hmm. That's the thought. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of uh, the competition that could come in from the other economies, my, my first thought is uh, certain companies have a cost advantage if you are based in India. For for example, if we uh, look at uh, Usha Martin or Balakrishna Industries, uh, they would have a cost advantage if you are based in India because of uh, human intensive nature of operations there. But in the case of uh, Ambia Cotton, if there's uh, competition or, or spinning that's coming in from an Egypt or, or a Latin America, you probably would lose the cost advantage that you have from having access to lower manpower, right? So I think that's uh, that's a very genuine threat, which we would need to explore as well. I mean, just one note, uh, Ambia Cotton is a Koyamutra based company. So the human capital is already high because they're getting, yeah. a, you know, like in Tamil Nadu, getting a labor is not easy because hmm. nobody wants to do a labor work. So just in case if that's the thing. Also, the similar lines, uh, also, you know, like Bangladesh is also a big player in this. So maybe yeah, yeah. because they are, they have even cheaper human capital. So it could be that we should probably have eye on them as well. Yeah. And 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 especially with, you know, a large part of the, the industry shifting from from US to, to Bangladesh, I think in Bangladesh we have a, a more intensified uh, competition over the last two years. All right. Okay, now uh, moving to the uh, balance sheet. Uh, there, there's just a few uh, key things to note here. Uh, the company has no debt on their on their books, which is, uh, which is of course a nice thing. Uh, the second thing is that the uh, gross block of the company is very old. So, so I'm not sure how how or to what extent this impacts their ability to operate at 100% capacity or would there be a need to have a very heavy replacement capex uh, in, the, in the near term? But this is, of course, uh, a genuine cause of concern that the cross block is, is pretty old and, and uh, the, the I mean, PV Chandran has, has, has uh, multiple times mentioned that some of this old machinery uh, still works in a very good condition, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's a positive thing or a negative thing and that, that's something which needs to be explored as well. But the most critical thing to note here is the, in the inventory. And, and we see that since 2018, um, the inventory numbers have been piling up, right? So 240 crores, 270 crores, 300, 313, and then currently at almost 400 crores. So I think this is the most uh, critical bit to note in the balance sheet. And, and the company had timed the market very well last year when they offloaded a part of the uh, a big part of the inventory when, when the cotton prices were up. But again, currently we see that the inventory levels are, are rising because of, uh, of uh, suppressed cotton prices. And the key question or, or the key bother here is how long is, is this sustainable? So if they're not able to 
sell what they're producing uh, and if corn prices let's say stay depressed for another three years or four years how long is it sustainable to keep holding inventory while keeping production at a, at a very high level you think uh, the inventory could answer your remark earlier when you said the margins were you know unnaturally low this quarter could it be inventory losses just something as simple as that uh, yeah, I, I was not actually able to find the the analyst like like the uh, result call or any transcript. I'm not sure if they had that. So it 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 could be possible. But then I'm also thinking, um, why did we never see that in any in any uh, quarter over the past five or six years before? So I'm just looking at the gross margin trends over years and. Uh, they have gone to 30% gross margins uh, on a quarterly basis, 30-32% in the past. But, yeah. So this yeah. has happened in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's just an inventory destocking cycle where inventory... Uh, and I think you also showed in your uh, yeah, in your Word document that the cotton prices just collapsed. So yeah. probably they took an inventory hit. And I think a lot of yarn companies took an inventory hit this quarter. Yeah, all right. I think yeah, that that could have been the reason why the margins have dropped to eleven percent last quarter. Mm. Okay. And All just right, so. one more point on your inventory, like if this is absolute inventory. Uh, have you also like uh, is the trend same in inventory days, uh, as a proportion of their sales or as a proportion of their cogs? Like looking at absolute inventory doesn't make sense. You you have to look at in terms of scale of operations. So in terms of absolute scale of operations, is it still the same or is there a huge inventory uh, increase where where sales or uh, cost of goods have not increased? Uh, I had done something on, let me quickly check in the Excel if I had that. No, I have not split the inventory by, uh, by the finished goods and raw material inventory and then compared that to sales. But yeah, I'll, I'll check that. Okay, and 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 just a, a health check to see that you know the ROC numbers of the uh, company uh, consistently been in the range of twenty twenty five percent over over the past past decade, right? Uh, now uh, coming to the the historical trend on uh, cotton yarn prices and 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 the spread between uh, cotton and cotton yarn. So uh, this is what we see the uh, fluctuation in prices of uh, cotton in the domestic and international markets have been. Uh, currently, we see that the cotton prices have uh, collapsed from the highs that they were uh, experiencing uh, towards the, the end of last year. And, and as a consequence, like uh, Indian uh, spinners have experienced uh, margin contraction. The other reason was that, you know, domestic prices were higher than international prices. So, so that was another reason why, why Indian uh, spinners have been also experiencing uh, lower margins in the past year. Uh, going forward, going forward, the uh, outlook is that uh, we, Indian spinners will see a 5 to 7% increase in volume. And 100 to 150 bits increase in margin in, in the spinning space over uh, the next uh, year, which which is going to kick off from the second half of this year. Uh, now, how how this uh, impacts uh, or or what how how this impacts the broader uh, spinning industry could be slightly different uh, compared to how this impacts uh, Ambia Cotton because the product is slightly different. Uh, now I think coming to the valuation, which is you know the most uh, interesting or, or 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 critical part of this thesis, is that uh, on thirty first March the company had inventory of three hundred and ninety six crores, right? Uh, One hundred sixty five crores of finished goods and two hundred fifteen crores of raw material and capital working progress. And the cash and equivalents on the books was uh, two hundred and seventy seven crores, which gives a total of cash and inventory which is equivalent to six hundred and seventy three crores, right? 
uh, it has zero debt. So total value of cash in inventory uh, is estimated at 673 crores. And here I've assumed that um, the inventory is valued at 100%, right? So we, we might need to factor in the fact that cotton prices might go down or, or stay at the same levels and that might have an impact on the value of the inventory. Now, the company has made profits of 21 crore in, in Q1 uh, 24. So this is 25. Now the market cap of the company is 950 crores. So if I adjust for cash and inventory and Q1 profits, the net market cap of the company adjusted for, for these three factors is around 256 crores. And I estimate that on an annualized basis, the company should be able to generate about 90 to 100 crores of uh, profits, which um, in turn should essentially flow into cash flows given the inventory levels don't spike significantly higher compared to the current levels. So what uh, the the investment thesis here is that the company is basically trading at 2.5 times uh, earnings or or, or 2.5 times future earnings. If they are able to maintain very decent levels of sales and, and the historical levels of gross margins that they have been able to maintain, right? So uh, one second, uh, Shatadol, I think if you look at the cash flows over a period of time, you'll notice that in FY23, the cash flow from operations was negative. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you look at closely to see why that's the case, you'll see that the they made, I think, around 170 crores of PAT, and then inventory is what dragged them down. So I think there's more yeah. evidence that it's likely inventory losses that has uh, possibly hurt the uh, EBITDA margins. Yeah, so are you talking of uh, Q1 24 or, or, or FY23 when you say inventory FY23. losses? Are... Yeah, in FY23, uh, uh, there's two parts to it, right? So if we look at the inventory increase, mm, yeah, in FY23, if you look at the inventory increase, it has gone up from 229 crores to 397 crores here. So, so because of the falling cotton prices, like they, they have... Mm, produced, uh, produced uh, the, the production levels was significantly higher than what they have been selling in FY23. Uh, the other point which substantiates this is, um, here, right? If we, if we look at cotton yarn, they have produced 183 lakh kilos of cotton yarn and they were able to sell only 109 kilos. So that's the uh, in inventory buildup in finished goods. And then there was also significant inventory buildup in, in raw materials as well. So one question on this, the cotton fabric that they make, is that mm -hmm. forward integration of cotton yarn? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so then the, a part of cotton if, yarn is also for internal consumption, but that is not captured here. No, so I'm, I'm asking if, you know, if, it, if it's made, let's say, 190 lakh kilos, is the 40 that's made in cotton fabric, is that made out of that yarn? No, there is an additional uh, additional uh, data there for internal consumption. So that data I have not included here. Okay. Uh, yeah. So basically, the, the the inventory thing is something which 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 uh, I I think is a is a bit of a hiccup about this company, right? Because of the high amount of market cap which is associated with the inventory, but. Uh, let us assume that we split the inventory into two parts, right? One is the operational inventory and the other is the financial inventory. So operational inventory is the amount of inventory that they would require to sustain their operations, right? And, and of course, you would not need to add any operational inventory beyond the levels that is existing, right? So, yeah, I mean, if we have that, make that assumption, uh, we can assume that the profits that the company is generating should be transforming into cash flows. Right, unless the inventory levels uh, go up significantly, which is why, uh, I mean, from a valuation perspective, um, this, I think, uh, I, so, I, I mean, to be honest, I have not found a good reason why this company should be trading at two and a half times earnings. And when you say two and a half times earnings, you mean uh, on an enterprise value, not on a market cap? Yeah, so if I adjust the yeah. market cap with the with the cash and cash and inventory that they currently have on their books. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the only risk to this two and a half times is you know cotton prices could fall further and they might need to devalue the inventory further. And and then uh, their sales sales might get impacted. But I I don't honestly uh, feel that they would see significant impact on margins as such. 
Have you tried meeting management? Because a lot of your questions, I think you'd be able to get a lot clearer answers from them. No, I have not not like met the management in recent times. So I, I used to like own this company for, for a while from I think 2017 till till the beginning of COVID. And then in, in, in COVID times, there were so many other opportunities available. I, I, I exited and, and now I think again, this has become a very interesting opportunity given the valuations and uh, some of the other, you know, key things to uh, be cognizant of if the investment horizon is is going to be longer than a, a two years or, or a two and a half years time frame because i mean th this thesis is just built on a two and a half year time frame right with the expectation that in two and a half years they'll be able to generate enough cash and and surely if they're able to book that cash on inventory in their in their balance sheet the company cannot trade at 900 uh, crores of market cap but uh, if the investment horizon is longer the two things that we need to be cognizant of is is how the company plans to deploy the cash and, and there's no good answer which the company has been able to provide on, on that front. They have done a, a one round of share buyback, I think in 2000, FY16 or FY17, and then the management said that the float is already pretty low, so they don't want to do any further buybacks. They have been saying in some of the con calls that they want to, um, they, they, they are looking at opportunities for inorganic expansion, but uh, they do not find anything at the right price and, and also the management is I think very conservative I would not back them up to be going for any aggressive inorganic expansion as such they have been giving out healthy dividends but I think it, it's pretty low given the amount of cash that the company is sitting on so I think the cash or the inventory on the books is is, is a real risk and, and any longer time horizon investment that needs to be factored in what's the plan there and the other concern is is around the succession, right? So, so the the MD or CEO is already very old, and and I think his his he has two daughters who are involved in the business, but they are not very heavily involved in the business as such. They do not hold any significant managerial position yet. So, I think there is an issue with succession, but that's uh, I think uh, a lower criticality. But but the fact is, uh, the the family PV and the family owns more than fifty percent of the business. So. I think these are two concerns with with longer term investment thesis, but but I think over a two and a half year period, like it 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 will be very interesting to see where the valuation goes after two and a half years if they are able to generate the amount of cash that you expect them to generate. Right, so I think so that is everything that I had on on this company, and and of course I think the most critical. Uh, follow-up analysis would be the ones which 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 you mentioned, right? So one is, you know, any competition that's coming in from Egypt or or LATAM or any of uh, those areas and, and how it impacts because um, that could be a, a very plausible reason why the company is not able to sell sell higher volumes, right? And and the other reason or or I think a big risk with the company is the value of the inventory or the amount of inventory that they're holding. So these are the two critical, I think, follow-up stuff. Uh, 